Good morning and welcome to the 25th, let me look at my watch, the 24th of July, 2022. Psalm 103 is where we are. If you'll stop the video for a moment, turn there and join us. We're going to read about six or seven verses and then comment a little bit on some of the rest of them and then go back and learn some important things from this psalm. Psalm 103, how to get rid of tunnel vision. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. My voice, my heart, everything. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all or none of his benefits. Then David starts listing them. Who pardons all your iniquities. Isn't it, that word all a really good one? Because if God had written some of them, I'd be in trouble. If he had just given a list like, here's a few, I will, and there's some other ones I'm just not going to, I just throw up my hands and quit. I mean, when you throw the Ten Commandments up there, pretty much I haven't broken all of them. But I mean, if you think, actually, when you think Jesus said, if you hate someone, it's as if you've murdered them. We pretty much busted all of them a few times over. But he said, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. And that's where I was before I came to Jesus. I had no idea what life was about. I was headed the wrong direction. I couldn't figure it out. And some young guys who looked like me, 1979, from Calvary Chapel. I had a bit of an afro and lived near the beach, Costa Mesa. Great, great guys. Welcomed me. I wouldn't have been able to go to another church. They wouldn't, you know, there was a day I would have walked through the church looking like that and they would have frowned. But I'm glad Jesus loved me as I was. He redeems your life from the pit, he crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. He satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. The eighth verse says, and then as you reflect through the rest of the psalm, You'll see verse 9 says he will not always strive. That means he's patient. He does not keep his anger forever. Isn't that good? He hasn't dealt with us according to our sins or rewarded us according to our iniquities. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. Just as the Father, verse 13 says, has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him because he knows our frame. He's mindful that we're just dust. And that's all I am. And when you come to that understanding that I'm just dust, then you come to the place where you say, without God, I'm helpless. I'm helpless, absolutely, 100% helpless. So Jesus invited people and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you feel you've got nothing in this world and you've got nothing to offer God, his promise is the king of heaven is yours. That's what it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I've spoken from this psalm several times in the last about seven and a half years I've been here. And I just want to say there isn't any passage of the Bible that can ever get worn out. They, they never grow old. They never go out of date. They're always applicable. They fit. They're usable. The reason why the Bible often repeats God's thoughts to us three times, four times, ten times 
is because our memories fade. We get fog. We forget. Or we get what I call tunnel vision. I'll talk about that in just a bit. So if you've ever had the experience, probably not, but I have, where somebody's been introduced to me, and about five minutes later, I'll think, what were their names again? That happens. We forget where we put our keys. Now, what they've got now are these little um, apples develop them, this little item you can put on your key chain and figure out where it is. So you go on your phone and you find out where you left your keys. Or you go on your computer and find out where you left your phone. The problem is, if you don't know where your glasses are, so that you can get on the computer and log in properly, you gotta find your glasses. So you need your glasses to find your glasses. So that what you gotta do then is go to the store and buy a really cheap pair of readers and put one in the kitchen, and a really cheap pair of readers and put one in the living room, and a really cheap pair and put one in the bedroom, and then put another one in the messing cabinet, so at least you forget, I don't have, I have where to put, ah, oh, it's gotta be somewhere around the house. Put those on, put your glasses on. And, and now you can see the computer and log in. How to get rid of tunnel vision. Word Nick, W-O-R-D-N-I-K. Word Nick describes tunnel vision like this. First, physically. When vision in which the field is severely constricted as like being inside a tunnel and looking out. So there are some physical maladies of the eye that create this and only allow you to see a very small portion. You lose peripherals, what it would be called. But there is another kind of tunnel vision that all of us go through. This place called it figurative. So that means that we're focusing our attention on one specific thing to the exclusion of everything else. So let me use an up-to-date illustration from a modern singer, pretty much, and then I'll go back a generation for those of us who lived in a different era. This is from a young guy who was part of NSYNC at one time. His name is Justin Timberlake. He wrote a song and he entitled it Tunnel Vision. It's his love song. Here's how it goes. I'm not going to sing it. I'll just read the words. A crowded room anywhere, a million people all around, all I see is you. Can you see the young lady swooning? Yes. <laughs> Justin sing. And everything just disappears, disappears, disappears. Yeah, a million people in a crowded room, but my camera lens only has been set to zoom. Now you know that's got to be a modern song. And all... It all becomes so clear, comes so clear, becomes so clear. I got that tunnel vision for you. Yeah, baby, I got that. So, a bit of a struggle with some good lyrics, but he's a young guy. So what does a young guy know about tunnel vision? Well, usually young guys know about tunnel vision when you sing about love. So all you think about is your sweetheart and how you want to go see her. And you can't wait for Friday night, go out someplace and catch a movie and get something for dinner. But if you're from previous generation, it's been just the same way. This was before my time, but it's a really good one. It's another group of young men, and their name was the Flamingos. Okay, now that song goes like this. Are the stars out tonight? I don't know if it's cloudy or bright, cause I only have eyes. For you. That wasn't done real good, but that's kind of how it goes. I didn't practice it. The moon may be high, but I can't see a thing in the sky because I only have eyes for you. You're here, so am I. Maybe millions of people go by, but they all disappear from you because I only have eyes for you. Tunnel vision. That's the good kind. People in love always had tunnel vision. People in pain have tunnel vision too. So what kind of tunnel vision do we get? Well, tunnel vision happens when our body's racked with pain. All you can think about is getting rid of it. 
tunnel vision happens when you hear that they're shutting the shop down. Tunnel vision happens when you hear your spouse or loved one has got an incurable disease and you're gonna spend the next several weeks or months doing the best that you can in dealing with it and you don't know what the future holds. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter how your sports team is doing. All that matters is this thing that you're focused on. How do you get through tunnel vision like that? David tells us how. When you can't see the end of the pain, you can't see the end of the tunnel, you can't see the end of the trouble, Psalm 103 reorients us and says, hey, listen, stop for a moment and let's widen your vision to see what God does for you. He brings light into the tunnel. So we've got a bad day, bad week, a bad month, a bad year, a bad couple of years, maybe. And suddenly, all of that dominates our thoughts. We can learn to deal with it. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to have those thoughts, just push them aside and think about what David writes and then ask yourself, is the forgiveness of all my sins and the healing of all my diseases, is that greater than this problem that I'm facing? Is God's loving kindness and compassion better than all of this? How do they compare? It starts with these words, bless the Lord, O my soul. So what does it mean to bless the Lord? In this particular area, it means to speak well of. It's the word that's often used during funerals when we do a eulogy. Eulogy is like you talk about your friend, your dad, your mom, whoever, and you talk about the fun times, the good stuff, and what not. That's the word. David is celebrating the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the bounty of God, and all that he's done for us. To bless the Lord means we recognize the many things he's done for us. So stop, think, and remember, let the darkness of the tunnel give way to the widening, opening light of God's word that gets your heart and frame of mind out of the tunnel and back into a place of peace and joy, even in the middle of your trouble. Paul wrote what we call, Paul the Apostle, the prison epistles. They're called the prison epistles because he was in prison when he wrote them. So in one of them, the book of Philippians, he uses these words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Here's this guy who's sitting in prison, writing to people who are sitting in pews in churches. I know that's a modern word, but that's exactly what it would be. And telling them, rejoice. Usually it should be the other way around, we figure, right? Tell somebody in prison, you should rejoice. And they, oh, I don't know why. Paul would say, I'll tell you why. Because God's good. God's bigger than this prison. And his whole attitude, his whole attitude, he'd say, you think the Romans have chains on me? These chains belong to Jesus Christ. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Crowns us with that. He satisfies your years with good things, so your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. Can it get any better than that? It sure can. <laughs> he goes on in verse 8. Let me see if I've got that verse up here. Nope. There it is. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. There's four terms used in this verse that describe God's actions toward us, his nature, his character. First, the Lord is compassionate. That means 
When we hurt, he hurts. You might call it empathy. But the word compassion means to suffer with. It's the two words put together. When we hurt, God hurts. It's really true. Sometimes we figure God is just out there okay and unconcerned, but that's the farthest thing from the truth. When his people hurt, he hurts. Compassion. The Lord is gracious. We've heard that word a lot. That means he is good to the undeserving. I've done anything at all to deserve any of his blessings. I come empty-handed with nothing to offer God. And I leave full. You know, the Bible, we talked a little bit about that whole process of plants turning sunlight and some elements into food for the rest of us. God says, Jesus did, that the Lord sends his sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. He sends his rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. God is good to everybody, whether you realize it or not. That's what that word is, gracious. The next phrase is slow to anger. Have you ever known someone whose fuse gets lit and it's short and it burns quick and then the bomb goes off? Boy, it's no fun to be around people like that. It's like, give it about three minutes and we need to be out of here because it's coming. Then there are other people who's got a really long fuse but they never deal with the fuse, it just smolders. And you wait and you wait and you wait. And neither of those are descriptive of God. Because following this phrase, slow to anger, that means he doesn't blow up quick at us, he's patient, is the phrase abounding in loving kindness. That's how God deals with his anger. He had to deal with it somehow. Ultimately, the cross is God's dealing with his wrath against sin. He's holy. He's just. He had to satisfy broken laws. So he did. And rather than punishing me for what I did, Jesus Christ Amen. took the punishment for my sins. So God was just in front of the entire universe, saying humanity has sinned and a human has died for all of them. God's just, and now he can forgive me. That's the greatest news you could ever hear in your entire life. I don't care what kind of a tunnel you're in this morning. If you'll just say, you know what? God's forgiven me all my sins. It's the greatest thing could ever happen. Amen. Nothing compares to that. Paul says, the momentary light afflictions of this world are creating in me a far greater weight of glory that awaits us. It's momentary light afflictions. Boy, when you're going through it, they don't seem momentary and they don't feel light. But they are. Slow to anger. He's compassionate. He pardons us, gracious, gives us what we don't deserve, slow to anger, patient when we fall. He abounds in loving kindness. He loves us more than we can even imagine. When he saves, he saves completely. Bless the Lord, all my soul, who forgives all my iniquities. When he forgives, he forgives completely. When he sets us free, he sets us free eternally. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Indeed. Charles Spurgeon wrote this about that eighth verse. All the word world tastes of his sparing mercy. Those who hear the gospel partake of his inviting mercy. The saints live every day by his saving mercy. They are preserved, they are upheld by his strong arms, everlasting. They are cheered on by his consoling mercy and they will enter heaven one day through his infinite and everlasting mercy.
A sermon on that verse, John Jim Nicodem writes, a long fuse, slow to anger, a short memory, does not harbor his anger forever. You ever had somebody remember what you did like 30 years ago? And they like bring it up again, and I, I thought we dealt with this. And yeah, we did, but we just need to go back over it again because I'm still upset. I'm glad God's not like that. He, he's not thin-skinned. Doesn't treat us like our sins deserve. He's got a huge heart. So great is his love, he's removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. So that's a fascinating geographical illustration. As far as the east is from the west. How far is the east away from the west? It's interesting that it doesn't say the north from the south. Because if you said north from south, you start heading north and eventually you get as far north as you can get. And the only place you can go from there is south. Right. However, if you start heading east, you can keep heading east forever. Just east, 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 east. Or west. Same difference. Pamela Park. Palmer wrote a short devotion my wife sent to me. She really enjoyed it. And I, I wrote down several of these. Gifts and blessings from God. If you happen to bring a bulletin in with you this morning, there is a spot on the back which you can put some notes if you're curious about the verses that these are taken from. What are the blessings God gives you now, today, every day, all day long, 24-7, 365, to help you with your tunnel? First, God gives peace, God gives joy, God gives hope. If you look at John 14, 27, John 14, 27, Romans 15, 13, there's a phrase in there, the God of hope. We're hopeless without him. When I pray and I say, I need you, God, he responds with giving me hope. God offers eternal life in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world. It's probably the most well-known verse around the world. If you were to ask anybody, just stop somewhere and just say, do you know any Bible verse at all? Most folks would say, yeah, I think there's one that says something about God so loved the world. And that's the one that he gave his only begotten son for a purpose that whoever would believe in him, trust in him, with a result that we shouldn't perish and instead have the benefit of everlasting life. Is that great? God provides us the armor of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, we need it. We get assaulted every day. Just turn on the news and see the trouble. And people are so afraid now to... <laughs> What a terrible world we live in. They pack up kids and picnic baskets and go to a 4th of July parade and some wicked man shoots and kills people. Who would ever figure that you just go out for a day to enjoy with your family and you're not bringing one of your kids home? That's the world we live in. Please, Jesus, help all those people. And the people from the school shooting in Evaldi, Texas, and everywhere. It's bad. For, there are bad people in the world. God gives us grace. God forgives. God is always present with us. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave you or forsake you. Is there another human being who can give you that promise? Not a one. And God restores. Yes. You know, the Old Testament prophet Joel said God had sent among his people warnings of locusts that ate up their crops in order to get their attention. And then he promised them, once, once I got your attention, I will restore to you the years 
that the locusts have eaten away. I will restore to you. God is a restoring God. It's important for us when you're in the middle of a tunnel to stop and focus on the blessings and benefits of God and that will dispel the darkness. It will kind of open everything up. Whatever circumstances you're in, to trust in him. We need to remember how good and faithful God is. Rejoice always, no matter where you are and what you're doing. Be content in all things. Paul the Apostle says, godliness with contentment. We live in a world that's very unhappy. If you hear someone constantly using the phrase, I wish, I wish, I wish, I want, I want, I want, they're probably not a pretty contented person. Probably not. It's always something else I got to have. And once they get that, then there's something else they got to have. Learn contentment. Peace that passes understanding. If we dwell on those things, the Apostle Paul says, keep your mind focused on what's good and pure and holy. It's got a good report to it. Doing that, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. That's a benefit, a blessing from God. Truly, we have great joy and hope in the Lord no matter what. So, I want to close with this thought. That tunnel that you're in, take the dynamite found in Psalm 103 and just blow that tunnel up. Get rid of it. Just blow it up. Explode it with the blessings of God, with songs of praise and deliverance, with thanksgiving given every day, all day, before your feet hit the ground. Just say to yourself, God said, this is the day I have made. It's the day the Lord has made. So rejoice and be glad in it. Those are good instructions. Before your feet hit the ground, thank God that you were able to wake up. As you make a nice pot of fresh hot coffee, or you've got breakfast going, or whatever it is, just stop and say, God, thank you that you sent sunshine and rain and produced food for me. If you hadn't, I would not have this in front of me. Thank you, God. Don't allow tunnel vision to dominate your life. The tunnel doesn't deserve it. Jesus deserves your praise. He deserves it. So bless him and thank him and praise him. There was a night where Paul and Silas found themselves inside a prison, shackled. About midnight, the Bible says. And you know what they were doing? Singing. The rest of the prisoners were probably complaining. Not Paul and Silas. They were singing praises to God. Praises that they were worthy to be counted among those who could suffer for the sake of the gospel. Yes, that's why he was in there. You know, Paul, as he made his way into the town, he always checked out where the synagogue was. He checked out where the marketplace was and people meet. And then he checked out where the, the jail was because he knew that's where he's going to spend the night. <laughs> it's all right. Now I know where it's at. In the middle of the night, they're singing praises to God. They didn't let the dark prison that they were in give them tunnel vision. They exploded it with the dynamite of the praises of God. And you know what happened? God threw out the chains, opened the door. And the Philippian jailer thought, I'm done, I'm in trouble. So he comes and he asks this question, because he's responsible for those prisoners. If they escape, it's going to cost his life. So he comes running up to them. And Paul says, we're all here. We're not going anywhere. And so that so impressed that jailer. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul was ready to preach the gospel. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And by the way, your whole household. 
So the jailer takes them home, takes care of them. Then they go back in for the next day. So they're ready to meet the magistrate or whoever it is. Paul's not looking to run away. He was looking for an opportunity to witness, no matter where he was. Let the blessings of God decimate the tunnel that you're in and spend time in praise and gratitude. What a difference it'll make in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one who rid us of tunnel vision and instead open our eyes to fully see the great things that you've done for us. Help us live the truths of Psalm 103. When we struggle, Lord, remind us. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.